Okay, Francis, we're all set. Francis, you're on mute. I thought, I th sorry, I thought I unmuted myself. I was speaking so well too, you know? You did a great job, I'm sure. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Hello and welcome to Abraham Lincoln's 1860 visit to Manchester presented by the Manchester Historic Association. My name is Francis and I'm a volunteer with AARP New Hampshire. Please note that today's presentation is being recorded. AARP has been promoting the health and well being of older Americans for over 60 years. Here in New Hampshire, AARP staff and volunteers work together to help our community, to help make our community a friendly, livable place to work, play, and explore for people of all ages. Additionally, we strive to bring you informative, innovative, and fun virtual events like today's presentations as a means of connection and inclusion. Next slide. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. Mm -hmm. To eliminate background noise, please be sure to mute your microphone. You are on mute if your microphone has a line through it. You are welcome to appear on or off camera, but again, we are recording today's presentation. So if you don't want your video camera on, just click on the video camera icon to be sure it has a line through it. We'd love to hear from you today though, so please use the chat box, which can be accessed by clicking the chat button and type your questions or comments where it says type messages here. Mary, a fellow, a fellow volunteer will be monitoring the chat and raising your questions and comments throughout the program. Finally, we'd encourage you to rename yourself so we recognize you in the chat. To do this, uh, move your cursor into the upper right corner of your own image and click on the three dots and click rename. Using just your first name is fine. Next slide. Our volunteers are committed to the work we do for Granite State's 50 plus population, and we can't thank them enough. Simply put, we could not do everything we do without their help and dedication that manifests in ways that brings tangible impact to our 220,000 members throughout the Granite State. Every day, our volunteers advocate for issues that benefit our members, such as lowering the cost of prescription drugs locally and nationally. They run local events for members that help increase awareness of AARP with a fun twist. They help to recruit volunteers so we can expand our offerings throughout the state. They willingly share their time and talent in the community conducting speakers bureau presentations. And most importantly, they embrace the AARP mission to enhance the quality of life for all of us as we age. If you're looking for a new volunteer gig, we hope you'll join us. Just email us at nhaarp at aarp.org. Next slide. I already went there. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay, <laughs> so let's welcome today's presenter. As a Manchester native, Christy has her dream job and the exciting task of sharing her passion for the history of her hometown with fourth graders across the state. Upon graduating from Central High School, Christy studied education at Notre Dame College and received her fine arts degree from Gibbs College of Art in Boston. She's a former public school teacher and artist by trade. These skills culminated in the unique position that she holds at the Manchester Historic Association. When Christy is not leading school groups, you can find her hosting American Girl Tea Parties, curating exhibits, and designating artwork for various marketing needs of the museum. Christy enjoys painting, camping, hiking, boating, and traveling with her family. She loves to drag her husband, Cale, and their two daughters, Reagan and Samantha, to every battlefield in the continental United States. She is just at home by a campfire as she at, is at an art. Christy, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Francis. Um, first of all, thank you so much for joining me today. I am so excited to be speaking to you. Um, the subject of my talk today is Abraham Lincoln's visit to Manchester in 1860. Precisely, Abraham Lincoln was here on March 1st and 2nd of 1860. 
He delivered an important speech in Manchester on the evening of March 1st and spent the night here. The next day he toured portions of the mill yard of the mill yard. So in case you were wondering, it was on a Thursday and a Friday. I always find that interesting. Silence that. This is a photograph of Lincoln as he appeared when he was here in Manchester. This is pre-beard, of course. The photo was taken in Illinois in June. The Manchester Historic Association owns an original print of this photo made from a glass print negative. 1860 was a presidential election year, but Lincoln hadn't decided to run for office yet. The former congressman from Illinois had become a national political figure due to the brilliance of his rhetoric in the Lincoln-Douglas debates during the Illinois senatorial campaign of 1758. Lincoln lost the election, but his anti-slavery speeches were read and discussed widely throughout the entire country. Right before coming to New Hampshire, he had delivered his famous, famous Cooper Union speech in New York City, which also focused on the issue of slavery. His speech laid out the logic that founding fathers had meant for slavery to eventually disappear, and that, therefore, it should not be allowed to spread beyond the current slave states. His fame was growing, and his visit to New Hampshire and the state got a lot of attention. The year 2009 marked the Lincoln Bicentennial, the 200th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's birth in 1809. The Manchester Historic Association honored Lincoln on this occasion with a special exhibit at the Milliard Museum. It was entitled Abraham Lincoln Manchester Remembers. The exhibit also commemorated the 150th anniversary of Lincoln's visit to Manchester. In this presentation, you'll see some slides and some information from that exhibit. Um, it's a really good opportunity to bring something like that back. So I really hope you enjoy it. Lincoln came to New Hampshire in 1860 to visit his son, Robert, called Bob, who was attending Phillips Exeter Academy. Lincoln thought he would give a few speeches along the route in New England to help pay his expenses. The Republicans in New Hampshire were particularly excited to be having him appear so that he could lend his support to the new party's platform and to Republican candidates for local office. Lincoln came to New Hampshire in 1860, um, not only to visit his son, Bob, but also to visit his friend, former Manchester Mayor Frederick Smith. He was an ardent Republican at this time and was serving as the president of the Republican City Club of Manchester. Smith volunteered to organize Lincoln's Manchester visit. He sent word to Lincoln requesting that he speak in Manchester and Lincoln agreed. Lincoln's first stop in the state was at Exeter on Thursday, March 1st. Here he met up with his son, Bob, and Bob's roommate and hometown friend, George Latham. The three of them traveled to Lawrence, Massachusetts by train and then to Concord, New Hampshire. They went to Manchester by way of Concord and Frederick Smith joined the Lincoln party. Smith was greatly honored to serve as Lincoln's host. This is the passenger station in Manchester where Smith would have met Lincoln. It was near the southeast corner of what is now Pleasant and Bedford Streets. This is very near the Milliard Museum's current building. So it would have been, you can see the sign that indicates Pleasant Street. The backside of the building that we can't see is Bedford Street. So it's positioned right now, very close to where the R.G. Sullivan building is. Lincoln and his party spent the day in Concord. He gave a two hour speech at Phoenix Hall on Main Street, which was essentially a variation of his Cooper Union address. They boarded the train and returned to Manchester, arriving at 4.15 in the afternoon. It was cold and rain was coming down very, very hard. Abraham Lincoln and his son Robert, George Latham and Frederick Smith boarded a horse carriage sent by the city hotel. Lincoln registered himself and the two young men for one night at the stay in the city hotel. This is what Elm Street looked at a little after the period. So this is very close to when Lincoln would have come. It was because we know that it's a, a hot point. Hmm? Did you have a question? No, I was just putting somebody on mute. Oh, okay. 
Um, so this is a photograph of what the hotel would have looked like at the time. Um, it is unfortunately no longer there, but it is still called the Smith Block. Um, the building has been replaced by this. This is a photograph of the city hotel. Believe it or not, parts of the original building still stand. You have to imagine the top floor cut off and the porches removed. This is what it looks like today. Lincoln registered himself, Robert, and George in the hotel register. This register still exists and is part of the collection of the Manchester City Library. It has been on display at the Milliard Museum several times, and you can see right where that red arrow is, that's where Abraham Lincoln signed in from Springfield, Illinois. This is Lincoln, Lincoln's signature in the register. It is at the top of the page, second line down, A. Lincoln, Springfield, Illinois, followed by the names George C. Latham and R.T. Lincoln in the same handwriting. So he checked everybody in. Lincoln was scheduled to speak in Smith's Block, which was diagonally across Elm Street from the city hotel. And this building still stands today and it still says Smith's Block. The four story Smith's Block has been built in 1853 by three partners, including Frederick Smith. Smith Hall, where Lincoln would speak, was located on the second floor in the rear of the building. Lincoln must have been impressed by the size and extravagant decoration of the Smith Hall. The theater was lavishly decorated with elaborate painted plaster scrolls and four life-sized female figures called caryatids perched high above the audience. This is a photograph of the theater in 1967, about three years before the building was torn down. Miraculously, the four female figures were stored in a barn for a very long time until they were given to the Manchester Historic Association in 1994. One of them has been partially restored is on display in the permanent exhibit. So with short notice, the Republican City Committee did all it could do to publicize the event in a local newspaper and on yellow posters plastered around town. The notice in the newspaper read, there will be great curiosity to see and hear him and a rousing turnout is inevitable. The enthusiasm of the people is irrepressible and the great trouble is to find a hall large enough to contain half of those who would want to hear them. It was announced that the cornet band would play and that the galleries were reserved for the ladies. There was great concern that the audience would be small because of the short notice and the bad weather. They didn't have to worry about that, however, as more than a thousand people showed up from the speech, many of them standing up until the end. There were many notables in the crowd, which was delivered about half between Democrats and half Republicans. Frederick Smith introduced Lincoln as the next president of the United States. Lincoln protested, saying that he didn't even think that three states would vote for him. There was some rabble rousers in the crowd, but Lincoln sparred with them, showing considerable political skill. One person recalled that Lincoln seemed quaint and almost strange in manner and expression, that he seemed like a man of intense earnestness and sincerity, gifted with all the arts of the best stump speaker. I doubt if there was a person in the audience who didn't applaud his speech, although many people didn't agree with him. The next day, the local newspaper, The Daily American, reported, Our citizen had a rare treat last night in listening to the Illinois statesman. It is pronounced by many that the ablest speech ever given in Smith's Hall. His speech had the force of argument that must have marked effect on every candid listener. The Daily American newspaper reported, The speech was one of the best and most convincing political arguments to which we ever listened. Mr. Lincoln's oratory is natural and unstudied, which makes it more effective. He possesses rare powers to elucidate and convince. Such a man must be heard to know his power. Some in Manchester were not entirely impressed. The Democratic newspaper, the Union Democrat, had this to say about Lincoln. Lincoln is a queer looking specimen of humanity and we can readily believe that the rustic simplicity of his oratory and the plausible mode of his reasoning would secure him some kind of popularity with that portion of the people of the West. 
who are capable of looking at one aspect only, a great question of national policy. And that one aspect only, of course, was the question of extending slavery. The next morning on March 2nd, Frederick Spith took Lincoln on a tour of the Amoskeag Mill Yard. Manchester was a thriving textile city at that time, and Lincoln was curious to see some of what he called the manufactories. Smith brought Lincoln to the Manchester Print Works, one of the larger companies in the mill yard, where he witnessed the various operations, including presumably the printing of designs on fabric, a specialty of the company. This is a quilt um, displayed at the Mill Yard Museum that shows just some of those fabrics that were produced here in Manchester. Um, it's pretty amazing that these are a couple hundred years old. They look like the same type of fabric you could get today at a fabric store. So this was really a specialty of the Amoskeg Manufacturing Company. And at the time, they were the only company in the country that produced this kind of printed fabric. Other mill cities were producing fabric where the pattern was woven in, but this was actually like screen printed right on top of the blank canvas. As he was preparing to leave, Lincoln was approached by John Brueger, an agent or manager in charge of the hosiery division of print works. Smith presented Lincoln with a dozen pair of stockings that had been made there. Lincoln accepted them gratefully and tucked them under his arm. Frederick Smith would eventually visit Lincoln in the White House. When he asked the president what happened to the socks, he pulled up his pant leg and said, I'm wearing a pair now. I guess they are rather dirty. Lincoln's next stop would be to the buildings of the Amoskeg Manufacturing Company, where about 2,500 people were employed at the time. He was brought to the office of Ezekiel A. Straw, agent for the Amoskeg Manufacturing Company and a Republican state representative. Straw welcomed Lincoln and then sent for a young machinist named Edwin P. Richardson to show his guest around. Richardson was surprised to meet Lincoln, who he had heard the night before at Smith Hall and was embarrassed as he was in his work clothes and his hands were dirty. When Lincoln put his hand out to shake Richardson's, who said, my hands are hardly fit to take yours, Mr. Lincoln. To which Lincoln replied, young man, the hand of honest toil is never too grimy for Abraham Lincoln to clasp. Later that day, Abraham Lincoln, his son Robert and George Latham left the train in Manchester. Lincoln would later give memorable speeches in Dover and Exeter. Um, this is an excerpt from Frederick Smith's diary. He didn't say much about that important day on March 1st when he hosted Lincoln, but he did make two entries for March 1st, 1860. The first one says, went to Concord to hear Abe Lincoln and Lincoln spoken in Manchester. And on Friday, March 2nd, 1860, he wrote, Abe Lincoln, $25 hotel and coach yesterday. It's always funny to me that these were the type of things that they wrote down, but I guess they didn't really have receipts. So this is kind of interesting to see that. It seems that Lincoln was reimbursed for his cost in visiting Manchester. In the right margin is written Republican. This may have been a reminder to Smith to get reimbursed from the Republican city for expenses. Another Manchester man also kept a diary, businessman and newspaper writer, Joseph B. Kidder. Here's a photo from his diaries which is in the collection of the Manchester Historic Association. Kidder, a Democrat, was in Smith's Hall to listen to Lincoln's visit. The next day, he wrote this in his diary. Last evening, I heard for a few moments the remarks of Abraham Lincoln of Illinois. I was struck with the difference in views which he expressed and those of his party for the past four years. He repudiates almost every plank of the Republican platform of 1856, but I do not know as he sees it. Abraham Lincoln won the nomination of the Republican Party on May 18, 1860. The Daily American wrote, Republican nominations for president, Abraham Lincoln of Illinois for Vice President Hannibal Hamlin of Maine. 
Here is his campaign flag, which is also in the collection. Um, the stars on the flag, we speculate were cut that way for convenience and ease of cutting, not for any other deeper meaning. He was elected president on November 6th. This was a tremendous victory for the Republicans. As some of you know, two of the founders of the Republican Party were from New Hampshire. Abraham Lincoln's friend, Amos Tuck, a congressman, and politician John P. Hale, both anti-slavery men. The new party was named at a secret meeting on October 12th, 1853 in Exeter. Many in Manchester fully rejoiced. There was a rally at City Hall and the Republicans bought 10 barrels full of tar that they were going to light on fire on the top of Rock Rimmon, but they decided against it as there was a brisk wind blowing from the West. Apparently the election results depended on your point of view. However, not everybody was as happy. In Joseph Kidder's diary on November 6th, 1860, it read, Never since my recollections has an election taken place to fill the chief executive office of the country like the one that has taken, that has this day taken place. In this vicinity, there has been no excitement nor enthusiasm on the part of anyone. And the voting today has been very light. The vote through the state will be small. Joseph Kidder, like many in Manchester, was fearful that Lincoln's election would lead to war. Of course, the nation did go to war. The Civil War would be fought from 1861 to 1865. And on April 15, 1861, John Kidder wrote, Fort Sumner has fallen. The bombardment lasted about 26 hours when Major Anderson surrendered. And thus the first act in the drama or maybe tragedy of the Civil War has closed, flushing the people of the seceding states with victory. It gives them the prestige of success, although the victory was at very unequal odds. 10,000 men to 180, but we live in the dark. And on the next day, on April 16th, he wrote, the military spirit is now fully up. The president has called for 75,000 volunteers. They are already in motion towards Washington, at least part of the troops. What will come of this no human wisdom can foresee. Perhaps our land is to be drenched with fraternal blood. Let us hope for a settlement. Manchester would play an important role in the war. Many Manchester men served in the Union Army. Manchester was the scene of military encampments early in the war and of a sizable hospital for wounded soldiers later in the war. The machine shop of the Amoskeg Manufacturing Company produced Springfield model muskets for the Army as well as carbines and also produced sewing machines that enabled the mass production of boots for the Union Army. This is a statue that we have on display at the Milliard Museum. The sculptor John Rogers got his start working in the Amoskeg machine shop. He tinkered with clay from the banks of the Merrimack River and eventually went to art school where he became a popular artist producing these plaster sculptures. He was also an abolitionist. Also in the war was the mention of a famous person from Manchester who visited Abraham Lincoln twice during the war. George Washington Morrison Nutt was a circus performer from Manchester. He is the little person on the right in his trademark styled naval uniform. He and his fellow circus performer, General Tom Thumb, has vis had visited the White House in 1863. When a reception was held in the honor of Tom and his new wife, Lavinia Warren. Lincoln was a very serious man, but he did like to have fun from time to time. You can see Nutt's boss, the famous circus empire, P.T. Barnum, on the left. The first thing you notice is he stood only 29 inches tall. He barely reached President Lincoln's knee. The display in our exhibit showed Commodore Nutt at his real size, only 29 inches tall, next to a cutout of Abraham Lincoln, which is actually a little bit shorter than his actual height of over six feet. Nutt only reached Lincoln's knee. 
um, there are reports that they became good friends and exchanged several letters throughout the short presidency of Abraham Lincoln. Here's another entry from Joseph Kidder's diary on July 1st, 1863. There are implications of a great battle in Pennsylvania. It will be a bloody one. I think it will be a very severely contested one. We shall see. He wrote again in July 6th. The battle I alluded to a day or two since is proving to be serious indeed. Of course, he was referring to the Battle of Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. Shortly after the battle, Frederick Smith traveled to the battlefield to help the wounded soldiers. He worked so hard that he became ill and had to get medical help himself. Here is the vest worn by Smith at Gettysburg. I actually don't have that slide. But In April of 1865, there were sure signs that the war was nearly over. General Lee of the Confederate Army surrendered, surrendered on April 9th. Joseph Kidder wrote on April 14th, my business took me to Boston today. The people there were more cheerful and hopeful than I had seen them for years. They believe the great struggle for the preservation of the government is over, and there is at least a prospect of returning to prosperity. But that joy would be short-lived as Abraham Lincoln would be assassinated the same evening. On April 4th, 1865, Manchester was in mourning. This is a photograph of Smith's block draped in mourning for President Lincoln. Even Joseph Kidder, who was not a fan of Lincoln's, although he learned to respect him as the war went on, was deeply affected. On April 19th, following the days of Lincoln's assassination, he wrote, a dark and heavy cloud has again overshadowed us and we can only turn to God for consolation in this time of trouble. On April 19th, he wrote, such a universal sorrow has never pervaded the people of this country as now. Almost every house is trimmed in badges of mourning as though the head of their family has departed. The very air deemed oppressive with the sounds and symbols of mourning. Oh Lord, what shall we do? A mystery would soon distract the people of Manchester. Here is a newspaper article from Monday, April 17th, 1865. The headline reads, Lincoln was to be, that Lincoln was to be assassinated was unknown, was known. Last Friday, it was reported all over the city in our mills and our workshops that Lincoln had been assassinated, shot. Lincoln, however, was still alive. In fact, the rumor had been widely spread 12 hours before the assassination and even made it as far as Dunbarton. Did somebody in Manchester know that the president was to be assassinated by John Wilkes Booth on that day, but supposed it had come off earlier? Everyone was alarmed, including the federal authorities. Was someone in Manchester connected with the assassination plot? An investigation was launched. It was widely reported that Manchester's streets 12 hours before his assassination that Lincoln had been killed. This prompted an investigation by the U.S. Provost Marshal's office in Concord. Possibly a John Morrison from Wilmington, North Carolina was in town, but he left before anyone could catch him. Nothing is definitively known about the man, except that he fled to Wilmington, North Carolina before anyone could question him. Booth was at a shooting gallery in Boston right before the assassination. It is supposed that someone from Manchester must have seen him at that time and learned of his diabolical crime, according to the Mirror. It is not known for certain whether or not Booth was ever in Manchester as a performer or otherwise. There was one known and significant connection between John Wilkes Booth and New Hampshire, however. His secret fiance was Lucy Hale, daughter of New Hampshire's ex-Senator John Parker Hale from Dover. Hale knew Lincoln before his election and Lincoln would appoint Hale as the minister of Spain in his new administration. Hale and his daughter knew Robert Lincoln and John Wilkes Booth. When Booth was killed on the 26th of April in 1865 in Virginia, a picture of Lucy Hale was found in his wallet. A letter from the provost general instructing New Hampshire Marshall to proceed with an investigation of any New Hampshire connection with the plot surrounding the death of Abraham Lincoln. 
The rumor was investigated by War Department. James B. Pry, Provost General Marshal in Washington, appointed Major William Sleavy of the U.S. Army to lead the investigation. Testimony was taken from several witnesses. A man named Edward Prime Pager reported that a certain John Morrison told him at seven o'clock in the evening that Abraham Lincoln had been killed. Mr. Prime told several other people, and by 1 or 2 p.m. in the afternoon, the news had spread as far as Dunbarton. <coughs> John Morrison was apparently not from Manchester, as no one seemed to know him. Someone thought he might have been related to Booth, while others looked at him as a co-conspirator. Before they could be found and interviewed, he left town, apparently, for North Carolina. So to this day, it is still a mystery as to why the news had spread to Manchester four hour, or 12 hours before his death. Um, when Abraham Lincoln appointed Lucy Hale's father to the administer of Spain, it was allegedly because he was having trouble with his oldest daughter, Lucy that she was getting mixed in with a bad crowd. Um, it later came to light that that bad crowd was actually John Wilkes Booth. So just a really interesting connection to New Hampshire. So I hope that you have enjoyed this presentation. Um, Abraham Lincoln's two day visit really left a lasting impression on the city of Manchester. Um, it turned a lot of the present day New Hampshire Democrats of that time um, to kind of understand the views of the Republican cause. Um, and I don't necessarily think that they rallied around the cause of anti-slavery. They really rallied around Abraham Lincoln um, with the honest sort of candid speaker that he was. Here's my little plug for the Manchester Milliard Museum. Um, if you'd like to know more about Abraham Lincoln's visit or the history of the Amoskeg Manufacturing Company, we do have a lot of information about Lincoln's visit, including those Springfield muskets um, and letters written between him and Ezekiel Straw on display. All right, All right. and then Francis, I'll give it back to you. Thank you, Christy, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. I certainly learned a lot about Abraham's visit to Manchester in 1860. I would also like to thank our audience for joining us today. I hope you enjoy hearing from Christy about this historical event. Please check the AARP website, which I put into the chat room. Does anybody have any questions? I thought I was unmuted. <laughs> so I don't see any questions right now, uh, Christy. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I have put our website uh, in the chat, www.aarp.org slash NH. And we also have our contact information. And Christy has also put the contact information for the Milliard Museum. Thank you very much for joining us today. We hope you did enjoy this presentation. Thank you.